on main. Amen. With you, Malcolm. Thank you, Paul. Okay, my testimony in the form of a poem. The first poem that I wrote as an adult, which is only uh, less than two years ago. And it's entitled, And Then It Happened. Early childhood, carefree, loveful. What better start in life? Yet a youth led astray was mine. Invincible, I thought. The special one, my perception. This world and universe, my dream alone. Me, the reality. Others, mere players. No wrong could I do. Then, it happened. Fear of being caught. Anguish resulting. Misdemeanors. I would quit, only to repeat again, force of habit, control of own actions beyond my grasp, face to face with imperfection, lacking, incapable, and with no direction, mortal state, a shocking revelation. Who are these two I know on the shelf and over the hill, on the margins, irrelevant, yet with brains, intelligence, more than a match for others, somehow happy, full of love, at peace. How can they be so, these Christ-like souls? No fool am I. Happiness, my aim, pure and true. Not mine to have, beyond my grasp, living like them, in state of happiness. Impossible, unattainable dream. Desires, poles apart from theirs. Brain transplant, solitary hope. Casual request to higher power, change my mind around, yet soon forgotten. Business as usual resumed. Then it happened. Sunny Scotland, holiday fun with friends. Honest, plain, faithful man of God, describing straight and true my condition, living in total disregard of sacrifice beyond measure, of open door, entry offered to life as meant to be, living with our maker, minute by minute, hand in glove, his living expression. No more I'm all right, Jack, engulfed by wretchedness, self broken, heart melted. Request miraculously fulfilled, at what cost? Free and easy for me, not for him. Emmanuel, God with me, no longer some far off potential reality. Prayer, simply a conversation throughout the day. Not God in a box, confined to Sunday church ritual. This now, my overwhelming sense. What am I then to do? I am his and he mine. Living for him, for others. The overriding purpose making sense of life, life lost to be truly found. What of happiness, real love, sense of peace, beyond reach of grasping self-pursuit, 
requested, but not expected. Miraculously, priceless gift found beyond description from the author and giver of life. Thank you, Thank you Malcolm. And uh, Malcolm has agreed that um, I could ask him a few questions that uh, come from that incredible poem. Um, and so Malcolm, question one, if I may. Who were the two people you refer to in your testimony? Yes, I mentioned these two, two individuals and uh, described as on the shelf and over the hill. <laughs> and, and I credited them with a, a degree of um, intelligence which um, made me kind of think about them. I'll tell you who they were. One of them was my youth, one of my youth group leaders in, in the church that I, I, I was brought up to go to because that was the, the concept was you, you went to church. You weren't necessarily part of it, but you went to church as in a church service. I went to Sunday school and anyway, there's a youth group leader and um, you know, I use that awful phrase on the shelf. She was probably at that point, 36, 37 years old, uh, not married, uh, living with an elderly mother, unemployed maths teacher. This is back in the 1970s. You won't get many unemployed maths teachers nowadays, I don't think. <laughs> um, so this was somebody I respected a lot. Um, uh, and I couldn't work out, she just seemed to be constantly happy, but not in some far away dizzy way, but this sense of contentment and peace and love that she just um, exuded all of the time. And I thought, you know, in her situation, how can that be the case in her circumstances? So it really made me think. Uh, and the other was uh, a very, uh, Elderly gentleman met on the streets of Bradford late November one year. Again, I was actually with my youth group from church. We were at a youth rally playing sports all day and uh, competitions. We had some time to kill. We were in the town centre. Came across this elderly man on his own on the street, heavy overcoat, little bit dishevelled, you might say. Um, and he had a little squeeze box and. Uh, those sorts of uh, gloves, you know, with a fingerless gloves so he could play this squeeze box but keep his hands warm on this bitterly cold Saturday in November. And um, we, we sang a few songs with him, Christian songs with him. And then we moved on. And I looked back at this man and I saw these two lads come up to him, probably 18, 19, 20 year olds, started mocking him and pushing him about. Five, 10 minutes later, they left with his little leaflets in hand, passing him on the back. He had an amazing impact upon them. He had this face, and I can't get it, I still can't get it out of my mind. This kind of serene again, peace, love. And I thought, what does it make this elderly man, a probably fairly poor pensioner um, from, from outward appearance, um, on his own, printing off these banded, little leaflets to give out with Bible scriptures in about becoming a Christian. You know, what is it about these people? Yeah, that really made me think. And that resulted in my, my little prayer, which was, um, God, you know, if you exist at some point, can you change my mind around? Because there's, no <laughs> there's no way that I can live in a happy life like them, even though they seem to be the happiest people on earth. Brilliant, thank you. And so as we move through your poem, what was it that made you realise in the end who was speaking to you? Uh, there's, a, there's probably a, 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 certainly a serious answer to that and also a slightly comical one. Um, so this, this uh, experience, I talk about Scotland. Those of you who are old enough, uh, we remember 1976, it was a very hot summer one of the hottest summers on record. And um, church youth group a uh, week away. Um, th the youth group consisted of three lads, 
I was the eldest of three uh, and, and four youth group leaders. Uh, it, was a, it was a funny situation. We'd, we'd lost a lot of members of the youth group over a couple of years. So anyway, I'm not a Christian at this point. I'd said this prayer nine months earlier. You know, God, it's a, completely forgotten about this prayer. You know, God, at some point changed my mind. Um, went away on this youth group, this, this youth holiday, Christian Endeavour. And uh, it was, it, uh, there was a little preacher. Um, I sort of about, talk about this man talking straight and true. No particular charisma, but his opening talk of the week to us was, uh, and the topic, by the way, was soul winning. If anything was going to put you off as a non-Christian, that was, that was the topic. Um, but his first talk was basically, young people, if you're going to go out there and win people for Christ, you need to know what the gospel is, what is the message. And he explained it. And he explained it. I'd never ever heard in all those years of church attendance the gospel explained to me. And um, oh, it went straight in, in inside me. And um, yeah, that was that sense of um, wretchedness that I spoke about in the poem. Um, I had I'd never had that before. You know, you, you justify your sins, don't you? You justify them to yourself. You say, oh, well, you know, uh, I deserve it. Or, you know, um, in my case, I've been shoplifting, you know, oh, they're not going to miss that. You know, it's big, big, big companies. They're not going to miss that. You, you justify things. And you don't really necessarily feel guilty. You'll get rid of your guilt by finding some way to um, to, to 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 sort of uh, blank it out. I think. Um, and then, so this was revolutionary, and I'm sure I could talk a bit more about that. So that was that was that. And 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 every day that week, I went for walks and um, I talked with God. And I was emotional, and uh, in my family wasn't the done thing to shed tears um I, 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 at that point i don't think i'd probably had shed any, any tears for at least a year if not a couple of years uh, i was 15 and a half at this point um i was shedding tears every 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 day i mean every day i went for, for a walk in the evening talking to god who now seemed to be right with me um and just just to, to just to give you the comical end of that story you know god being coming real to me at the end of the week um, I le left a camera on a beach and uh, suddenly realised that left left this camera on a beach without giving the full story. Um, I was scared, silly. Uh, I'm going to tell my parents about this camera that I've lost. You know, it was a precious possession. Uh, certainly couldn't afford a new one. And uh, what, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And a few hours had, had gone by. And um, the... Uh, we went back to look for this camera on the beach. Of course, it, well, we couldn't find it. The youth group leader I mentioned earlier, the school te unemployed school teacher, she unusually went off walking on her own on this beach, uh, left us all, the rest of us looking or playing football or something to try and take my mind off this camera loss, which was completely at the top of my mind, uh, front of my mind. But when we assembled to go to go back and have cocoa for the evening, and she came right up to me and right, up, right straight in front of my face, and she said, "Malcolm, don't worry, you'll get it back." And she said it with such certainty. That's what registered with me. Needless to say, an hour later, we're back at the uh, Christian Conference Centre where we we're staying. And somebody stood up and said, did anybody lose this at the beach today? Well, this is kind of five, six hours after I'd lost it. And uh, we'd had evening meal, we'd, had, uh, we'd gone, gone looking for it. But it, it wasn't so much that it, it turned up, it was, it was her certainty. And again, it's a face I can never forget. And, and, I, and me saying to God in the car as we drove back from the beach to the conference centre, well, God, if you... If you, if you pull this one off, you'll be doing well. <laughs> and of course he did. Yeah. Anyway, there we are. So that, that's how God became real to me. Thank you. Uh, one more question, Malcolm. 
and uh, an honest one, I guess, in a sense, what has God changed in you? Uh, the short answer is everything. Um, but that's a little bit, perhaps some people might feel that's rather trite. If I could just pick on one aspect of my life, because it's relevant right now, this poetry writing, I didn't even believe I could write a poem. Um, and I didn't even know that what I wrote was a poem <laughs> when I wrote this, which was back at the sort of in February last year. Um, there is a story around that, perhaps I can share that with the church at some point, because again, God is really at work. But the purpose of this writing is to share uh, that my testimony is the beginning, but I've written about another five or six poems now, um, to share them with business associates or former business associates of mine, particularly through LinkedIn or through uh, speaking at events. And I want to do that because I would like to give an explanation for why, uh, for, for the way I've gone about doing business or managing or leading an organization, which I have in the past, um, as a way to, to help others to come to terms and, and face themselves and face God, really, and to, and to um, become Christians. Um, and it was, for me, it was completely life-changing um, and completely changed the way that I would have gone into my business career. You know, as a 15 year old before as a Christian, it was all about making money because money was going to make me happy, wasn't it? That, that, that's what I understood. The world told me, you know, get a, get a well paid job and, and you'll be happy, you know? You'll have everything you need. Well, yes, you may have some of life's comforts, but it doesn't make you happy. And I discovered that, you know, when you, when you realize there's something wrong with you as a person, uh, then, then you realise that's something that money can't buy and only God can sort out. And, um, but in relation to the business world, it therefore transformed what I was going to do. You know, I was going to become a qualified accountant, get a nice well-paid job and become a very well-paid businessman. All of a sudden it became, oh Lord, where do you want me? What do you want for my life? way you know and how do you want me to to do with this and and being challenged as i went through my business career so in that sense and that's what i would like to try and share with people how how god has enabled me to behave differently to what i would have done otherwise thank you thank you, thank you so much malcolm for for sharing that with you thank you very much indeed very very great it's a pleasure thank you.